singing in the dead of night. Take these broken wings and learn to fly. My name's Duncan McKenzie. I'm chairman of uh, Birds Australia Glue Pot Reserve, and I've been chairman for six years. The reserve itself was purchased by Birds Australia in uh, July 1997, um, and we purchased it because there was a, an extremely rare and nationally and critically threatened bird living on uh, glue pot called the black eared miner, uh, and it was right on the point of extinction, and it was known that there were a few colonies. So Birds Australia went out to its membership, and in uh, 10 weeks uh, they raised um, three hundred and thirty thousand dollars to purchase glue pot reserve and none of that money came from from government so the reserve was purchased all the stock the sheep was taken off it in size glue pot reserve is fifty four thousand hectares or five hundred and forty six square kilometers so it's rather large and it's uh, in this point of time has got the best conditioned mallee left in the world um, there used to be 18 dams on the reserve, uh, we've uh, bulldozed in 16 of those and we've kept two dams and put a herbivore proof fence around so goats and kangaroos can't get to the water. Um, the reserve itself has 18 nationally threatened species of birds on it and there are very few areas in the whole world that have got such a concentration of threatened species so it makes it a different place to anywhere else in the world. We've got 53 species of reptiles occur on the reserve and some of those are nationally threatened and 12 species of bats. It's a very species rich area, one of the most species rich for bats in the whole of Australia. Uh, and the reason for this is that we've got a, a large invertebrate or insect population which is the main food source for most of the wildlife or biodiversity that lives on glue pot reserve. Um, my name is Jock Brommel and I come from Port Ferry in Victoria. This is the third time that we've been rangers at Gluepot. Uh, the first time we saw an advertisement in a bird magazine asking for applications for rangers, so we applied and we got the job and stayed here for two months. And uh, each time we've come there's been an important project. The, fir uh, the first time we came here we built what they call a squirrel shed, which is a big storage shed for different things that are needed to run glue pot and uh, this time we're doing this electric fence which is 12 and a half kilometers of uh, goat proof fencing. Well glue pot is managed by a management committee uh, of which there is a chairman who is Duncan McKenzie and then there's approximately eight to ten members of that committee and they meet on a two monthly basis and they make the decisions uh, about the um, running of glue pot on a large scale and they also decide what purchases might be made um, for the assistance of running glue pot but uh, on a daily basis the glue pot is um, run by the rangers uh, they're responsible for just the day-to-day -day things um, the most important thing that the rangers have to do is do the weather twice a day. Um, we have a computer that's owned by the Bureau of Meteorolo Meteorology and they supply this um, for us to put in the weather at 9 o'clock in the morning and 3 o'clock in the afternoon and for that glue pot gets about $10,000 a year towards the expenses of running glue pot which in total amount to about seventy thousand dollars a year. Um, the other things that the rangers have to do is um, meet the visitors when they come in if possible, make them feel welcome, answer any questions they might have about uh, where to camp or uh, what birds are about at the moment, where they might find them. Um, we also have to look after the three camping grounds that the visitors use. We provide about five bird hides around the property for the visitors to sit in and they can look out onto a bird drinking trough which is set up on stilts off the ground so the cats supposedly can't catch the birds when they're drinking. Uh, we've got authority as rangers to 
shut roads and uh, close glue pot entirely if we had a big rain and the roads became impassable then uh, we put a notice up at the entrance to the glue pot road just to say that the whole reserve has been shut. We also have authority to ask campers in the camping grounds to either move or leave glue pot entirely if there's a dangerous fire situation which could be started by a lightning strike or something. Um, at the end of every month we go around the uh, rain gauges that are spread around glue pot and we measure the monthly rainfall and we also take measurements of the water levels in the rainwater tanks and the uh, dams that we pump the sewage water for the sewage and septic tank systems uh, and we also have some fire reserve tanks spread around the property and we take the measurements of those too and that's all recorded and sent to the uh, country fire service so that they know what storage is available if they have to come and fight a fire on glue pot. Um, we have a number of programs that uh, have been going since we started. One is a feral control or a pest control program. Uh, goats, feral goats that have been introduced in Australia many many years ago uh, are the greatest destroyers of natural vegetation. Uh, you can get years where there are droughts on and kangaroos are dying from from thirst and yet the goats uh, are, are breeding and populating because they'll eat just about anything so they really destroy a lot of vegetation so we've been working on getting rid of the goats off glue pot reserve for many years now we've um, built a 30, uh, 36 kilometer um, electrified fence along our northern boundary to keep the goats out and we've just completed another 12 kilometres along our western boundary of electrified fence to keep the goats coming through from those two properties on our north and our west. They're both what we call pastoral properties, they're still being run as, as sheep properties etc. On our southern and eastern boundaries they're conservation lands owned by the Commonwealth of Australia. Um, so we've got this program that uh, uh, to get rid of goats um, throughout the Commonwealth of Australia lands and the glue pot lands. We also do uh, have the Sporting Shooters Association uh, come into glue pot at six or seven times a year to shoot goats. Um, we've got a, um, a what we call a Judas goat program and uh, we've got these transmitting collars that we catch some goats and we put the collars onto the goats and let the goats go and goats are very social animals, they love to get together in groups so the goat with a collar goes out and finds a mob of a herd of goats and stays with those so that when the shooters come out we can simply go out with a receiver and track the mob down and get rid of them. We've got a program also that uh, looks at uh, weeds etc. So we're very active in uh, getting rid of the weeds on Glue Pot Reserve. Most of the weeds occur only around um, the dam sites that we've closed. Uh, they don't spread out into the rest of the Mallee, which is good. So Glue Pot Reserve is run entirely by volunteers. There are no paid workers whatsoever. Uh, and our volunteers put in an average of 29,750 hours per year. Um, donated hours to glue pot to work on glue pot reserve. We've got a management committee of about 17 people with very highly skilled people in all different things like business management, uh, environmental and conservation management, weed control, feral control, a library person, another one that's experienced in data management and so on. Um, the reserve has a Bureau, Australian Bureau of Meteorology weather site which we run for the Bureau of uh, Meteorology taking readings twice a day that go via laptop computer and modem straight into the Bureau of Meteorology computer in Adelaide so that information is going through in real, real time to the Bureau. Uh, we run a lot of um, research and monitoring programs. glupot has been built on what we call four pillars. Uh, the first pillar is the conservation and enhancement of the environment um, through land management. Gluepot's built a what's known as a Gluepot land management model which is now being adopted by countries like Germany and Spain and a lot of the um, non-government conservation bodies in South Australia for the running of their conservation reserves. So that's the, pillar, the first pillar. The second is scientific research and monitoring. The reserve um, 
has been the, has the, is the recipient of 37 major awards covering science, the environment, conservation, the built environment, health, ecotourism, tourism, etc. So there are very few organisations of our size anywhere in Australia that has won so many major national and international awards. So that second pillar is scientific research and monitoring. We have a lot of projects that we run on research and monitoring projects that the reserve manages on, on Blue Pot itself. We've had researchers in catching region parrots in mist nets and they've been banding those birds so that they can follow them uh, and they'll have information on those birds if they're ever caught again in another mist net at some stage. They've also come out here and caught birds and taken blood samples to try and see if there's any blood diseases in the birds. Uh, we've had people out here doing pitfall trapping and they've been looking for reptiles and little mammals. We also run short courses at Gluepot and the, the range is uh, helping in administering and uh, the day-to-day -day running of those courses. We have courses in nature photography, uh, painting nature, uh, the uh, vegetation and there's bat courses uh, and we've even got a researcher who comes here and catches bats and he monitors them very closely. The third pillar is uh, environmental education. The reserve runs 13 environmental two and three day courses every year. And the fourth pillar is uh, ecotourism. Uh, Glue Pot Reserve is one of the major ecotourism destinations in Australia, particularly for bird watchers because of the fact that we've got these 18 nationally threatened species. It's a very active place, there's always something happening. Uh, we've just finished today setting up six pit line sites and the friends of Glue Pot are up here for, for five days to monitor those sites to uh, catch reptiles and mammals which they'll identify, weigh and then release back into the environment. So there's always something happening on Glue Pot. Blackbird fly Blackbird fly Into the line of a dark black Okay, well we've got 18 nationally threatened species on glue bot. As I said previously, there are very few areas in the whole world that have got such a concentration of threatened species. And there are very good reasons why these 18 species are located on glue pot reserve. Some of the species are just vagrants. We, you know, they come in and they'll be here for a few days or a few weeks and leave again and may not come back for another two or three years. But the majority of the 18 species that are recorded on the glue pot actually live here all year round. Now some of the species are the mallyfowl, and this is a, big, a bird that looks like a really big turkey or a chook, and they're unusual in that they lay their eggs under the ground and build a big mound up. They're one of Australia's, I think it's four mound building species, etc. And they've got a, a sensor, a, a, a temperature sensor in their beak, and they can poke their beak into the mound and see how hot it is, because it's the the temperature inside the mound that actually helps incubate the egg. So at the beginning of the season they drag in all this leaf litter and when it, when it rains and gets wet they then cover all that with soil so that starts fermenting and producing heat. Then the female comes along and she'll lay anything up to 18 eggs and she may only lay one every a day or a couple of days and they open the mound out again she lays another one and they close all this huge mound up with dirt uh, until she's finished laying. So in the early part of the season it's the rotting fermenting leaf litter that's inside the mound that generates the heat to keep those eggs at a constant temperature. But if you get suddenly get hot days which is going to increase the temperature what the birds have to do is they come with their big claws and they dig all the all the dirt or the soil and the sand out to expose it to take a bit of that heat away. Or if it's a cold day, they'll put more soil up or take soil out to increase or decrease the heat. And as the day, as the season goes on and the leaf litter is cemented and sort of worked away, then they depend on the heat of the sun. So they'll come in the morning, test the mound and take a lot of the dirt out so the sun can get directly through to it. Unfortunately there are a major threatened species throughout Australia 
We know some of the reasons, but not all of them. One of the reasons is that they've lost a lot of their, um, lost a lot of their uh, territory, etc. They're, um, they're threatened by things like foxes mm. that will, uh, will take them. Um, and uh, the problem is that they, when the eggs hatch, the little chicks are way down in the bottom of this mound and they have to work their way up to the top of the mound and they come out and they'll sit there for a while and then they're on their own. Their own. The adults don't look after them and then they run off into the scrub, etc. And they're very, uh, they're very prone to be taken by foxes and that. Um, so loss of territory is, is one big thing when uh, you know, developers come in and they want to get rid of all the trees and land and, and uh, to, to do more cropping or whatever they want to do. Um, so it's a, lo a loss of their habitat is probably one of the main reasons why the Mallee fowl uh, is having such a problem. In the last few years we had a, a drought that went on for about five or six years. That was a big problem because there wasn't enough rain to wet that uh, leaf litter that they had to put into the mounds uh, to, to start fermenting so a lot of the breeding wasn't successful. Then we've got other birds like the big major Mitchell cockatoo. Now the major Mitchell is a fairly big bird nests in hollows so the hollows have to be fairly big and it can take hundreds of years for a hollow the size that they need to breed in to develop by just rotting away or white ants getting in so it's a fairly big hollow so if this habitat is being bulldozed down by farmers for more land etc and all the big trees go then the major Mitchells can find it a problem to find hollows big enough to breed in then we've got things like the, um, the little robins etc um, again, loss of habitat. They need their ground-dwelling uh, birds. They spend a lot of the time on the ground getting their um, insects and things like that, their food, etc. So, again, if there's destruction of the habitat or there's the um, the other herbivores eating all the the uh, the um, the leaves and the uh, trees, etc., etc., it's taking away a lot of the food source for a lot of these animals. So that's a problem in, with with loss of habitat as well through the kangaroos and goats and sheep eating a lot of the uh, vegetation etc so there's quite a loss there. The miner that was here that we bought the um, purchased the reserve for is a bird that likes old growth habitat in other words something that hasn't been burned for over 50 years it doesn't need to come into water to drink every day uh, and of course what's happened is farmers have come into this the land that it likes to live on and they build all these dams for extra water for their sheep and this has meant that another bird called the yellow-throated miner who lives in the agricultural areas has moved into the territories of, the, of our other miner and has started taking over those territories so what we've done is we've closed off all those dams and, the, and started pushing the yellow-throated miner back into the, into the uh, agricultural lands leaving, leaving it for our, our miner that we need to survive etc to give it back its old growth habitat and take away all those degraded areas around dams and of course natural growth is starting to come through in those all those areas where we bulldoze all the dams so that was that's a real success story and and we've taken some of those colonies and moved them into other areas in the state where the vegetation has come back after being destroyed suitable for the miners um, and we did two releases of what's known as a soft release and a hard release the soft releases uh, the um, Melbourne Zoo built this huge aviary in this area of Mallyfowl and we collected this colony of, of uh, birds when they had young in their nests about half grown we collected all the nests captured all the males and females took them down into the what's known as the Mallee uh, sunset country and put the uh, nests with the young up in the trees inside the aviary and released the birds etc so that when the young developed and started flying we opened the doors and they all went out and some of them uh, we had uh, transmitters connected to them and then the hard releases we, we simply went to a good patch of scrub and put the uh, nests up in the trees and released the birds and, and walked away. And we thought, well, if they stayed in that area uh, and started breeding in about two years' time, it would have been hugely successful. What happens, they started breeding in eight weeks. Uh, there's a problem also up in the Kimberley area of Australia, in northwest Western Australia, where the farmers are doing fire breaks by burning the spinifex annually. And because of this, 
uh, the Gouldian finches are being starved of the opportunity of eating the spinifex seed because for spinifex to set seed it needs to have about three years of growth and if the farmers burn this spinifex every year as a fire protection measure then the Gouldian finches are robbed of their food and therefore their numbers are depleting uh, and they're becoming quite a rare bird now. So the threatened species on Gloopot. Gloopot's very important for these birds. It provides a safe habitat for them. The habitat will never be lost. Um, about the only thing that gets affected is if you get the drought years where the rain isn't as heavy as it normally is, etc. We've got the feral control programs, the weed control programs, which heat, help, help keep those things at bay, etc., which makes it better habitat for all of these threatened species. Very few of the threatened species, apart from the uh, mallyfowl, have actual predators. The mallyfowl have the foxes, of course, and foxes will predate any birds that they can get hold of, or small mammals and reptiles. We fox bait six times a year. We put our baits over at a hundred different stations around the reserve six times a year to, uh, to reduce the fox population. Uh, and of course, if, when our shooters are going out and they're spotlighting, if they see them at night, they'll shoot the foxes as well. We do get cats coming in occasionally, um, and cats again uh, are, are huge predators of uh, particularly ground dwelling birds and things like that, any birds that they can catch. So we try to catch where we can cats, although they're very, very difficult to trap, so you have to mainly rely on shooting any that you do see. But luckily we don't have, I don't think, a very large population. Rabbits, which are a big population in most other areas in Australia at the moment, there's a few around but they come and they go, you see a few and then you mightn't see any more for a couple of years so we don't have to do much with those. So it's mainly the goats, the foxes and the cats uh, that we, uh, we really keep the pressure on to, to keep numbers right down. Blackbird fly, blackbird fly, into the line of a dark black night. Um, on Gloopot Reserve, the introduced species that cause us the most problem are goats, foxes, rabbits and cats. Um, um, when we brought things like goats and foxes to Australia, foxes is a very good uh, uh, animal in point. They came over from England, uh, they were brought over from England and hundreds of years ago. And in England, of course, they have uh, very definite seasons, very cold winters and very warm or lukewarm summers, etc. Uh, and this kept breeding, um, the breeding of foxes under control was when they came to Australia, we don't have those extremes. Our winters can be said to be comparatively warm. So a lot of the species that were brought from other countries like England, etc., where they kept their numbers under control, were introduced to Australia and they just went mad. They just kept on breeding all year long. So this is one of the reasons why the numbers, as, as, as it is with foxes, just exploded across the country. Rabbits, the common rabbits were brought out as a, as a, as a, from England. Again, a few, a few pairs. They've now spread across the whole country and it's costing Australia billions of dollars to try and eradicate them. And, and you know, millions and millions of dollars in research to find viruses that we can inject into rabbits to, to eradicate the rabbits in Australia. But, you know, as soon as one virus gets going and goes through the rabbit species, it uh, soon um, um, loses its impact and the rabbit numbers start to build up again. So it's cost Australia billions and billions of dollars to control rabbits. And of course, rabbits are one of the greatest destroyers of vegetation and they, they get into the understory and the undergrowth. They dig holes, they dig warrens and um, cause the collapse of the soils, etc. So. Uh, we, we have a real uh, problem in our river systems in Australia because the European carp has been introduced into this country and uh, they've got a, a habit of going along the bottom of the uh, rivers stirring up the mud so that pollutes the uh, fresh water system by making it muddy and uh, that's creating lots of problems and the carp are breeding and there are people harvesting them uh, commercially. They're even making uh, fertilizers for market gardens and things out of the carp, but really 
uh, it's a problem that I don't think we'll get on top of. They just uh, they can control them and keep the numbers down, but really they're not going to get on top of them. Um, but taking an example like Kangaroo Island, where another species was introduced, which is an Australian native, and that's the koala. They didn't exist on Kangaroo Island, but they were taken over there some years ago. And the koala is um, a species that has to have a certain um, types of gum trees to live on, to, to eat. Uh, they won't eat all species of uh, gum leaves, only certain species, and Kangaroo Island had those. And because the koala has no natural predator, the numbers just built up and up and up and up. So what's happening now is that they're eating and stripping all the uh, gum, gum trees on Kangaroo Island until there's going to be none left. And the, it was recommended, the Department of Environment recommended to the, um, the State Premier that, we, that they cull 30,000 koalas off Kangaroo Island to get the numbers down. And he refused to do that because he thought um, that uh, tourists would get upset if all the koalas are removed. So um, it hasn't happened, but the koalas are still eating all the gum trees and eventually they'll all die from starvation because they won't have any food left. So there's an example of a native introduced species taken from one area where they occur naturally and put into another area where they shouldn't be. So introduced species in Australia have always caused a problem, things like the cane toad that was brought, uh, brought in from, I think it was South America, to get rid of a species of insect that was in the cane fields in Queensland, has spread across three quarters of Australia now, and as it goes it wipes out native species of reptiles and that because they have a, a poison in their skin that when the native reptiles eat them, they get poisoned and die. So there's another classic example of an introduced species causing a huge problem. Um, so, yeah, introducing species to another country is something that needs to be looked at very, very seriously before it's ever done. And we realise these days that, um, in most cases, that uh, it probably won't work and it'll only cause problems. The other huge problem that could potentially affect Australia is if Australia was to get foot and mouth disease introduced from overseas in the livestock, uh, we may be able to control it in certain areas domestic in domestic animals but when you get out in the uh, open country we've got so many feral animals that could spread this disease that there'd be absolutely no hope of this disease being controlled in Australia once it got afoot and therefore we would be banned from exporting all our meat products overseas and probably anything else to do with those animals such as hides and wool would also be banned and that would be an absolute disaster to the Australian economy. Blackbird fly Blackbird fly Into the line of a dark black night Glupot does this amazingly well. Um, as I said before, we've got these 18 nationally threatened species, 53 species of reptiles, 12 species of bats, etc. So, Glupot is a cocoon of natural species here that people from all over the world can come and see. And to see all these species in other areas, I'd have to travel to a lot of different places to find them, whereas on Glupot they're in one area. Um, preservation of native species itself, if we don't do that, it's uh, it's just a destruction of the environment. Yeah, native, native species have a very, very hard time uh, living in areas where there are a lot of introduced species. So Glupot is, is one of those havens where native species have a chance to breed up and move into other areas to help populate the other areas with native species. That, so if Glupot wasn't here, a lot of that wouldn't be happening. Waiting for this moment to arise. You are only waiting for this moment to arise. You are only waiting for this moment to arise.